it, it's hard to bridge the divide between spirit and flesh. It, it is a real hard divide. And I know many that will want to say, nah, man, I, I know the difference, but we really don't. We, we teeter all the time on the default to fall back to where we've always been or, or to use what we think we know. Uh, we, we've used all kinds of things. And this is what really gets me is why are we gambling with eternity when it's a sure thing? You understand? Know it's a sure thing. It's not, there's no possibility of failure in God's plan, none whatsoever, okay? So yet we, we struggle greatly to believe that God is able to perform even the things he said in the past, can he do that today? Now we do have a lot of past knowledge. Past knowledge don't help us though, okay? I can know all those things about what he's done, but it's not about what he's done. Now, I need to know today, 2020, <laughs> what is he doing now? So we can't find a point of reference, and so we struggle to try to line up the past to make God work in the present from a past, somebody's past experience. Every experience God going to give you is a present experience, right? Brand spanking new. Hasn't been used before because it's the first time he used it on you. And even though yours may look similar, but just like fingerprints, we all are different. Very uniquely different. So what it takes for one will not always take for all. You know, we say that thing, what God done for one, he'll do for all. Well, no, it's not necessarily true because there's some things uh, he, didn't, he, he didn't deliver James when he delivered Peter. If he done, Pete got an open door out, I'd have felt kind of slighted to still be in there knowing that me and Pete was brothers. But they had a different purpose. And I think the most important thing that we have forgotten is that God called us for a purpose, okay? And yours may be totally different than mine. And a lot of times, we want people to come under our perceived purpose, not the one that God has for them. And so we took away people's desire to know the purpose of God for their life because they're not sure. And I think in our new birth experience, uh, in our identity, get it? We, we messed around, got the wrong identity, and we started following that and thought it was supposed to be our nurture. But see, we supposed to get our identity from the Spirit of God and not from the Spirit of man, not from man. And so we've been trying to fit in, uh, cooperate with man to please God. Our first response to everything today, I would rather please God. How do I please God? I can only please God in one place is where God is pleased. And that's in Jesus Christ. That's the only place. I get outside of Jesus, I have no place to please him. There is no amount of things I can do that will please God if I'm outside of Jesus because in him, I am well pleased. I was reading... In, in the book of Ephesians, I, I used to like to read slow sometimes. Every now and then when I started reading slow again, I began to pick up things that I thought uh, or overlooked in the first reading. I think you probably could read the Bible a thousand times, and each time you read it, you're going to pick up something that you didn't pick up the 999 time before. But as I, I slow down my reading, because my thing today is, I think the biggest problem we have in God today is that I love Bible studies. I love teaching the word of God. But I do know that that is not enough for the individual Christian person itself. Unless that person is really intimate with God, 
there's no way I could teach you enough revelation to bring faith in your life. Now, you get excited by revelation, and you'll get excited, man, that was really powerful. That's good. But see, no revelation is powerful if it doesn't change. But it can't change the individual if it hasn't changed the one that's given the revelation. It's not, you know, most people have quotes, and I've read many books, and they love to quote what someone said about Jesus, and, and they go strong on that. You know, this is what this guy said about Jesus, man. And I don't know how many people have hit that brick wall trying to make what someone said about Jesus work for them. And you can't, you know, if God can talk to them, have you ever asked yourself why he can't talk to you? Huh? You are not a stepchild. Okay, you, you don't need a mediator. The only mediator between God and man is Jesus. He's the only mediator you need. So now if I need to hear from God, which is scary, like I said today, we've made it so that most people are afraid to even think they can hear from God. We preached them, told them that you ain't good enough. How can you go to God when every Sunday all you hear is that you've fallen short? How can you have confidence that you can go to God when, when every time that you hear preaching, you ain't even came up to even part of it? And so you walking away instead of feeling like a victor, you feel like a victim. And so you're going to go to God. And not only do you go to God, but you live your life defeated as a victim. Man, I'm a victim of the devil. I'm a victim. No. I am more than a conqueror. All right? I, I didn't, it ain't what I conquered that makes me more than a conqueror. It's what he conquered for me that makes me more than a conqueror. But in Ephesians, which I, 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 like I said, there's some books in this Bible that I really appreciate a lot. This is one of them. And uh, the book of Ephesians is quite a healthy book full of a lot of nuggets that seem to unfold mysteries, as Paul mentions most of the time about these mysteries. And, and it's like, even today, he has given you to know all the mysteries. So people walk around and say, man, I don't understand. But it's not because you can't. It's because you choose not to. But he has given you to know all the mysteries, every last one of them, mystery of Godhead, mystery of whatever. If there's a mystery involved, God being in you, the mystery, the mystery of of uh, him manifesting glory in your life. It's a mystery. So God says, I've been giving you to know that, though. It's not like you can't know. It become down to, do I really want to know these things? I have listened uh, to a lot of things lately because I like to, Hear what people are saying sometimes. Not that I'm not that it's going to change me, but I every now and then I like to put my fingers to the wind just to see where how the wind is blowing. And you usually will find out in the spiritual arena by lifting your fingers up or listening where everybody is headed to. You know, we we still in this uh, state of fear and. Most people will hinge more on the fear rather than the favor of God. And so their minds are staged. Like I have I've never heard so many people again every time we have a pandemic. Guess what time it is? Yeah, end of the world. And, and you hear the thing. If you believe that you will say, why would you panic? That, that don't make sense to me. If you know that you will say, why would it even bother you? Okay, even if it was tribulation. He said, I will be with you. How, how, 
always. So somewhere I think we fail to realize what he is, who he is. If I had to go through, and, and we wouldn't be the first people. He, God is known to always fortify his people in those times. We read about it, we get excited, man, you know, then when he was in Egypt, you know, and the, and the plagues was coming and, and the people of God was protected, but we don't believe in that protection. Kind of scary, ain't it? Man, the end of the world's coming. What are we going to do? The same thing I've been doing all my life with God. I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm not going to try to figure out if the trumpet blew last night. <laughs> I am not going through all those phases because of what the Bible say. Not, and, and I feel bad when I say that because you'll say, well, that's what the Bible said. They got it out the Bible, yes. And the Bible says a lot of things, but the one thing about the Bible is that you cannot fool yourself and not really get into God and think that you'll know it. These things are not revealed through our knowledge. It's revealed by his spirit. I can know the Bible. I can quote the Bible. I've been through the Bible a bunch of times. A lot of people haven't been through it, and even preaching ain't been through it one time. I've been through the Bible. I ain't trying to brag on my knowledge because forget the knowledge. Forgetting those things. I count those things as dumb. I thank God that he gave me fodder to read and do all that. I had a desire to do that. But all that stuff means absolutely nothing. Arguing and, and getting, uh, went into debate, debates mean absolutely nothing. Proving my point means absolutely nothing. I'm not here to try to prove a point. I'm not here to try to prove you wrong. I'm not here to do any of that because... As you believe, so be it unto you. That's all I got to say. It's not a matter of who's more right because there ain't but one right. At the end of this day, you're going to find there was nobody more right than the other. Blood is what made us righteous. And it took that blood to make you righteous. So it's not about being more right. You can't be more than what you are. You can only be what Jesus is in you. Paul, who is my favorite, probably everybody's favorite because he wrote about half of the New Testament. But Paul, we know, was one born out of due season. In other words, Paul was that guy that became an apostle out of the season when God was calling the apostles. When Jesus called the first 12, Paul was not among them. But he was not only just called out of due season, but the thing that Paul done was this. He had to get a personal revelation of Jesus, all right? When he first got called, knocked down, all of a sudden, what the first thing he wanted to do, it's like everybody do, you get the Holy Ghost, get saved, you know who you want to get saved? All your friends. You're going to do your best evangelistic work in your first six months of being saved. Because all your friends, you're going to be telling them about Jesus, all right? And they're going to be just like Paul's friend were. <laughs> Don't come around me talking about that. That's what they told me. All my good friends, man, I mean, we had parties together, but no since I got Jesus and told them about this newfound friend I found, they didn't want to have nothing to do with me. Broke my heart. Same thing with Paul. Paul even had the nerve to say, for my brethren's sake, I wish that was accursed from this gospel here. That's strong language, knowing how powerful this gospel is, but he loves his brothers. But you're not going to be able to help your brothers by trying to straighten them out in the flesh. When you show up, you show up. One of the things we have been so guilty of is trying to convert people to us and not to Christ. You know, we, we're, we're, in a, we're in a real quandary right now because most people are upset 
and they have never really been along with God. They never had the opportunity to be along with God, and God finally gives them the opportunity to, you know, if this was like the Feast of Tabernacles, which we're supposed to have been in the first place, as they went back and studied all these things and realized that the Feast of Tabernacles meant that every man had to get up and leave from where he was and trust God to keep what he had. The Feast of Tabernacles is when they had to get up, go out. They couldn't sleep in sealed houses or none of that. They got tree branches and all that stuff and put up little pup tents away from everything to show their trust in God. Many of us feel like uh, the people of, of, of Noah's day. If it's a bunch of us, he can't kill us all. <laughs> So you need to understand about the Lord. When he chose Israel, he said, you know what? I did not choose you because you were many. But I chose you because I want to put my love or show my love upon you. See, God's plan is so much different than ours. And so many people today are missing God because they're still trying to figure out what they need to do for him. Stop the press. It is time for you to figure out what he has done for you. All right? And get that settled in your heart. God is not going to do something for you today and take it away tomorrow. The Bible says he, them that he's sanctified. He, he did what now? So now, he sanctified me. Forever. So what I need to do as a sanctified person is to know what did my sanctification bring me. Instead, we'll turn around and tell you, man, you, you need to get yourself sanctified. Well, you never did understand the first sanctification of him sanctifying you. And then he saved you and then he said, oh, man, now, now I got to work on being saved. You have never understood what he done for you when he saved you. So when problems come up, sickness come up, you know what we do then? We lose faith in salvation. Because salvation is not what we have put it out there to be. Man, you better come on and get saved so you won't have to go to hell. God's not even worried about that one. He didn't save you so you could fear going to hell. He saved you so he can show his salvation in your life. He knew there's going to come time in your life. You're going to need deliverance and you're going to need healing. It's funny how we claim to be saved and then we get sick and now we need a different Jesus. The same Jesus that saved you, the same Jesus that healed you. It don't take any more faith to be saved than to be healed. Well, at least that's what I see. You know, because he made it very plain. He said, what it, which is easy for me to do? Tell you to take your bed up, rise up and walk, or your sins be forgiven. So you, there is no more faith that's necessary to be saved than to be healed. But we made it a whole different ball game. You get saved, and then you get sick. Now you need to call on Jesus again. You need to do something different than what he done before because evidently he must have saved you, but he forgot to heal you. That comes in a package. You don't get the salvation with all of the amenities that's in the package of salvation. You're not getting saved today and then all of a sudden you get sick and now, now you need to. He was a healer as a savior. All that was in the plan and the package. Well, praise God. I know they keep talking about my Medicare plan right now. You know, they're trying to give me more stuff on it, you know. Uh, see, I, I, I want to tell them I already got a good plan right now. Got a package deal. Free. <laughs> I got the whole package. When I got Jesus, I got it all. Hospitalization, medication, and whatever else is <laughs> I mean, but we are looking for more because we haven't discovered what we have. Once we discover what we have, 
then we can just kind of like rest like he told us to. You know why saints can't rest right now? Because they don't believe they got what they got. And so they're busy thinking that if I get busy, God's going to get busy too. I need to tell you something. He is still sitting down. Oh, here we go. No, Brother Wilson, can't God see what's going on in the world? Trust me. He made this world. And it's not one thing he can't see in it at all. He knows everything. But what we're trying to answer, we're trying to find some other solutions to problems that only has the answer in Jesus. The only place you can find it. Oh, bro, wasn't that just too, that's just too easy. It must not be because you ain't doing it. If it was that easy, you'd try it, wouldn't you? But you know what? Why it's not easy? Anytime you get your flesh involved in your life, because it's fighting against God, the corner man is enmity. It's his greatest, it's your greatest enemy. It's your natural thinking. God is not natural. And I don't care how you try to put it. I mean, I heard one man tell me one time, and you, 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 just, try to, you just try to find too much spirit and stuff. It's, it's the only way you're going to find it. This ain't revealed by flesh. It can only be revealed by his spirit. But anyway, here is Paul. Paul is one of those kind of guys that has what I call tenacity. Whatever he believed, he believed. Okay. If he believed it wrong, he believed it truthfully wrong. And he was very much committed to believing it like that. And I think that's a good quality because I think the Bible says that let every man be convinced in his own heart. And I don't think every man has been convinced. Paul was the kind of guy, if you can convince him, if he got convinced in his heart, it was right, then it's worth dying for. All the things he went through, he had to be convinced. You can't go through life and be convinced of something and suffer what he suffered and not really be truly convinced. You got to be convinced it's being convicted. You know, we got convicted of a lot of things. We got convicted of radios and TVs and everything we got convicted of, right? But none of those convictions changed us. We had all kind of conviction. I came in, man. They had me convicted. I couldn't even wear sandals for a minute. I didn't know what to do. I put on a T-shirt, wife beater. Man. All the saints got on me. Man, what are you doing? Just had a T-shirt on. You're showing too much flesh. Well, we all should come in covered. Wrap your face up. That may be too much. How much flesh is too much? But I was not, it was an innocent thing. I wasn't really trying to make no point. I'm just trying to live. But it's funny we get convicted convictions, natural conviction, but we don't get spiritual ones. Usually all our convictions are about something fleshly, but never spiritual. Why don't we get convicted of his love? Hmm? Do we ever get convicted by that? I mean, really convicted? Why don't you get convicted by his peace? So we go through life, we have all these things, we struggle, here's Paul, he gets his experience, and he thinks that he's got enough to run on. He runs, <coughs> he runs, but he finds out that, nope, everybody ain't going to love truth. I don't care where, where we are. And one of the hardest people to ever reach in his life, now I begin to see, is when you make 
religion, void of relationship, you can't make it because it's going to break down. There's no faith built in religion. I, this is not Brother Wilson telling you this. The Bible says that what they were doing, he was never pleased with. So now, Brother Priest, why would I go back and try to do what they done that he never was pleased with? Hmm? That'd be like me taking a second wife. And I tell her what I wasn't pleased with. And then she's going to come back. My new wife going to try to repeat what my first wife done. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying. <laughs> and you done told her. She done read your book. She looked and seen what his first wife done. And he tells you. Now, you see what my first wife done? I never was pleased with that. So then you come in, and you want to think that you're going to practice what she practiced and still please him. That does not make sense to me. So that means that if I'm the new, if she's a new wife, she needs to get in a new place and learn what it means to please in the new place. We need to know what does it take today to please God. We put a lot of ketchup on our sandwiches, but that's not pleasing God. And you can tell whether or not it's pleasing God by what's manifested from all that you're doing. There's one thing about God. You don't have to walk away scratching your head because you don't know for sure what pleases him and what doesn't. But I already, if he tells me, if I tell my honey, honey, I like oxtails and potatoes. And I come in every day, she give me hot dogs and french fries. How long do you think this relationship is going to work? Huh? Yeah, I know. I got a lot of grace. But how much grace do I have to give before she finally cooked me oxtails and potatoes? Same thing with us. When are we going to get tired of giving God what he's not asking for and started giving him what pleases him? Right? Without faith. And I, I don't think that's, that's registering. That, that's not really coming up to the top. Without faith, it's impossible. To me, that's plain. So what would I be working on? What would you be working on? I mean, what would you really be working on? If I know this is the only thing going to make him, you know, he, he got my mansion and everything, everything is nice and everything, and, and I'm eating good every day, and, and, and still I'm not wanting to please him, though. Well, he just take what I give him. And there's a lot of people take that route. He ought to be pleased that I'm giving him this. See, you're not dealing with Pookie. <laughs> you're dealing with Jesus now. He don't have to have you. But I can tell you this now, you will need him. All right? So I don't just want to say, well, this is all, this is the best I can do. I, ain't gonna, I can't do no more. You lie. You're lying all the time. You're lying to yourself. Because first of all, you got too much you in that to ever please God. If you get out the way, you'll please him. You, but he may not come through. So what? Suppose he don't. I mean, is he going to stop being God because he didn't come through for you? Does that make God less because he didn't come through for you? I didn't, I, I didn't read that. See, what I read was a little bit different. See, what I read was Jesus came through for me. <laughs> and 
And when you start looking at it from that standpoint, now it's a lot different. Your prayers begin to change. But you start talking about, man, you know, God, he need to come through for me. No, he do not. No, he do not. That's not, that's not what Calvary's about. The gospel was about him coming through for you. And to keep experiencing the gospel, you will see how he keeps coming through for you. But you can't make him come through for you on your terms. It's got to be on God's terms. That's right. So that means that uh, you should never be upset or out of sorts because you got into a dilemma and God ain't working in a dilemma like you. You know what I'm saying? Like you're looking across the aisle. Well, he did this for so-and-so. Why ain't he doing it? Because there's a different plan for you. Something different. Like he might you may suffer the rest of your life here on earth, as you call it, because you see it as suffering. You see yourself as being one who was suffering. But God sees you as a different testimony. Huh? Could it, can he do that? Huh? I mean, I, I hate to use those guys in the Bible that we don't like to talk about, like that little Lazarus, the, that beggar guy, you know. Uh, could it, did God come through? Hmm? Did he come through for him? Don't you think that man at that gate would have wanted God, his prayer would have been a little bit different than God, you know, why can't I have the big house that the man got and why can't I dress like that man dressed and why is it that I got to be out here every day and I'm picking up crumbs and dogs licking souls. Why has it got to be me doing that? And yet you have people talking about I want to be a testimony for Jesus. That's not one place in your life where God is not with you. Not one place. Would I want to be the beggar at the gate? Absolutely not. I wouldn't volunteer for it. But if it was appointed to me to be that man at the gate, then I'm going to trust God in his grace to make sure. There's only one thing, because in this life, really, the only thing you really need, air, food, and water, and a little shelter. That's all you really need. If you can get that every day, you probably can live a while. Take one of them away, you may not last long. So just to be thankful, just a simple essential things of life that God has given us, no, it tells me that God has come through for me. Right? When you woke up this morning, did you feel God came through? <laughs> huh? Because if you didn't wake up, then you, somebody going to be saying, man, you know, God took them away. God took them out. Is that the worst thing can happen to you? That's the ultimate thing that everybody has to do, Right? But Paul, he goes to the mountain of Arabia. He spends three and a half years, about three years, three and a half, something like that. And guess what he was doing? Getting to know him. Now, I can't say I have spent three and a half straight years just on the backside of a mountain. But I have spent about 40. <laughs> and the Bible said that Jesus kind of taught Paul, revealed to Paul, gave him revelations, things that Paul knew. Because when he came from that place and started preaching, this dude had a real dynamic ministry. Even preaching things that Pete would say, man, some of these things Paul be talking about, man, they kind of be hard, they hard to be understood. You know what I'm saying? Paul had been with Jesus and Jesus is our best Sunday school teacher. He'll teach you stuff that you, that you never ever thought of. I'm not just saying it, I'm telling you. 
He'll take you one scripture and drain your brain with it. Just feeding you from one scripture. Things you think you might know, he'll show you better. But Paul in, in, in Ephesians, uh, he, he gives a lot of his uh, pedigree. He talks about in, 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 in chapter 2, he says, he is quickened who were dead in trespass and sin, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the church of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation, in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of flesh, and of the mind, were by, by nature. That's the key word. You're born with a nature. What well, by nature. This is what most people do not understand. If you've never done anything at all, if you was born in this world, never robbed a bank, never stole granite's pie, none of those things, by nature, you are his children, a child of wrath, fitted for wrath. Why? By nature. Because God cannot deal with that nature. Remember I said the corner Mind, as a nature, carnal nature, is God's greatest enemy. It's, it's greater. Matter of fact, he defeated the devil and he's still having to fight you. You ever thought about that? His greatest enemy was not the devil. Matter of fact, the Bible put an angel on him, threw him in the pit, but, and didn't even get an angel a name. So his greatest enemy is not the devil. He said, I triumphed over him already, right? I made an open show. I triumphed over him. But he said, I do have an enemy that's greater than the devil. And that's that corner mind. It has declared war against God. It cannot nor will it receive the true things of God. It won't. So we don't want to say that. We don't want to feel like that, man, no, that can't be right. You know, because, man, I, I take a bath every day, and you're still dirty. <laughs> and you're still dirty. Because <laughs> God ain't cleaning flesh. He's cleaning spirit. <laughs> and what, we, what will happen is that it, what's bad is that you got to, a so-called clean, dirty body and a nasty spirit. The Holy Ghost is not a nasty spirit. The Holy Ghost is not an ugly spirit. Okay? You're never going to see Jesus acting like that. So Paul talks about, by nature, that you have become the child of wrath. People wonder why so much trouble come to their life. Trouble's going to come anyway, but how we deal with troubles and how I perceive troubles is how, is really is how we perceive God. If I see it as being a problem, if I see everything as being my problem, that means I haven't really got his solution yet. All right? I, I, I don't think that God will keep you in the church for 40 years and all, you, all you've done is, is, is struggle and been oppressed all the time you've been in God. That, wouldn't, that don't even sound like salvation to me. I don't think that you'd live. Man, I've been living with God. I've been, I've been holding on for 25 years. Turn loose. What you holding on to? Hmm? I mean, what is there to hold on to? Ain't it like you got a rope to hang you? It's time to turn loose and let God be God. We're holding on. When we say holding on, we ain't talking about holding on to God. We're holding on to that last ounce of Kelly's life. <laughs> don't take this. Please don't take this. Leave, this. Leave me one more piece. You know what I'm saying? You be like old King Saul. Come to God. We know what he wants. And then we tell God when come to accountability, Lord, I've done everything that you wanted me to do. 
I've done it all. But what about the lowing of the oxen? What about the bleeding of the sheep? The things that you thought was more important than obedience. You kept them. And then had the audacity to say, you, you know how we justify stuff? I'm going to use this for the Lord. When it really, in essence, all we're thinking about is lamb chops and steaks. <laughs> That's all we're thinking about. And then I'm going to eat, and then I can justify all that too because I'm going to eat that food, then I'm going to get fat, and then I'm going to use the other scripture. This belongs to the Lord. <laughs> so either way I go, I'm just going to keep rolling. Because see, it's one thing about us. We know how to justify everything that we do. We'll find a justification for it. If it's somebody we don't like, then we'll go back to the old covenant and try to kill them. <laughs> you know the Bible says, eye for an eye, two for two. Yeah, I know what this said, but Jesus said, no, but I say. <laughs> that was said. No, and I don't have a get even. You got one? Have you ever had it? Have, since you've been saved, have you felt that good even kind of spirit come upon your mind there? Yeah. You never felt that? I have. Yes, I have. Mm. Then I had to read the scripture says, vengeance. And I, then I want to kind of twist that a little bit and say, you know, God said, vengeance is his. He will repay, but he, he, he made me the bill collector. <laughs> I am here to call your debt. <laughs> he wants me to pay you, right? Have we ever did that? Of course we have. Yeah, we, we, we pulled those tricks, and they felt holy, almost sanctified, because we did it all. In Jesus' name. Here's Paul. Though. Now, Paul's having what I consider a real experience. He's never going to be the same again. The early apostles, they also had a real experience. But in their community of their experience, because we put so much pressure on each other, there's so much pressure being pressured on other people to conform to what they call the norm. And, you know, the, the Jews were in Jerusalem. I mean, that is the heart of Judaism. And it's kind of hard to come in here one day talking about I believe in Jesus and, and then you're not going to do all the things that we've been doing all the time under the law. And they were very upset with that. They didn't mind Having Jesus as a Savior was a great idea. It sounded good. It would help bolster what they've been doing all their life, they thought. They thought it would really bolster what they've been doing. But what they didn't understand, Jesus didn't want that system at all. He came to do away with that system to bring in his system. We need to understand that Jesus came radically. He, he was radical. Very radical. The apostles were very radical. The same thing Jesus stood against is the same thing they stood against. But you'd have to go in here thinking, when Jesus came, he didn't even come trying to keep, he was, he was really kind of messing them up. How many times did they come and say to him, Man, he's out there doing some stuff on the Sabbath day. Now, see, to do stuff on the Sabbath day meant you get a rock concert. Remember the one little young man back in the book of Genesis? I mean, in Exodus, where he went out and picked up sticks. You know what happened to him on the day he picked up sticks? They stoned him. Jesus come in. He goes to the cornfields picking corn. Sound like work to me. And they wanted to stone him for that kind of stuff. Because he came to upset everything. He didn't come like everybody else preaching what they were preaching. He was trying to change their hearts. 
because they had a real knowledge of the word. If anybody could lay claim to having a knowledge of the word of God, these guys had it. I don't know whether you ever seen any of the Hebrew writings and all that kind of stuff, but boy, when they get down and pen some of these books, the Talmuds and all this stuff, how they would take and take one little verse and write a book from it. The letters and making the letters mystical and the numbering of the letters mystical and bringing out all kind of mystical things from just one verse. I think it's in uh, Numbers 21 or something like that. I'm not sure right now. But they, out of a few scriptures, they got 70 names of God. By playing with the letters. They had 70 different names of God. I know you probably ain't known about that, but they did. And they was able to bring all this mystical stuff in. So here, here you know, Paul, he's got, the same kind of knowledge. This guy is very, very smart when it came to scriptures. He didn't come behind in nothing. He had scriptures on top of scriptures. But it was funny when he read them. Because he'd been with Jesus, and what Jesus done is showed them what the scriptures meant. He brought the scriptures forward. He brought them from the past to the present. Everywhere Paul would quote the scripture, he would bring it from the past to that present moment and show them how this scripture is now being revealed. We're still taking it from the past, but we can't get revelation for the present. Part of our problem is, yes, we know the scriptures. We know what they said. But unlike Paul, who had been with Jesus and got revelation, he was able to bring that and say, now, this is how this scripture is fulfilled today in the church. Okay. He wasn't just quoting. Because most of them were still kind of like, they didn't know whether they should keep the feast days. They didn't want for sure whether or not they should do the Sabbath day sacrifices. They had no idea. They were still trying to wrestle with the idea. The book of Galatians says the same thing. The book of Hebrews, we find the, the struggle. Do we get all of Jesus or do we try to hold on to a little bit of the past just in case? That's why when you read the scripture and they say there's no other name given among men where we must be saved, you understand that he's bringing this thing down to it's Jesus and it's Jesus only. And you get people get up and say, man, y'all them Jesus only. I am not offended by you telling me I'm a Jesus only. Matter of fact, I feel real privileged. Because <laughs> if you got a better name than that, tell me, would you? It is Jesus only. And it, you know what really get me? Because if you don't know that it's Jesus only, then you're looking for someone else. So when you pray, you're not praising, praying to Jesus only. You, you're praying to something, but you're not sure if it's Jesus. You're not sure if Jesus does, is the only name. It is the only name whereby we must be saved. That word saved again. We ain't talking about getting saved so I can go to heaven. Or the, the concept that we have about God today, man, he's saving us, man, from this awful world. If he want to save you from this awful world, do you really want him to save you from this awful world? Because we can pray tonight and believe together that tomorrow you may not be here. <laughs> huh? Do you want to get out of here? You hate this world so much you don't want to be here? Is that what you're saying? Hmm? Man, this world's so bad. Do you want to leave? It's strange how we can talk about how bad everything is. But we're like frogs in water on the stove. The heat turned on. The water was cold when we got in. But it's heating up. And it's done heated up so much that it's really getting hot and just making us move a lot. And we're about to boil to death and don't even know it. 
get out the pot. Okay, jump out the pot. No, you keep trying. Well, I'm going to put some rubber boots on. Maybe I can stay in. Give me a fireproof suit. It's too hot. See, I ain't asking God to do anything he didn't purpose to do. You know what Jesus prayed? The world was bad. He said, Father, I pray that you take them not out. Don't take them out of this world. But just keep the evil one from them. I wonder who he's trying to keep from you. Probably trying to keep you from you, right? <laughs> Because when the evil one comes, he can only sit up where you have position, have a position for him to sit up. Jesus said the evil one come, but he has nothing in me. So where are you at? Because if you're in him and the evil one come, that statement still holds true. If you're in him, he has nothing in you. Right? Because he can't find nothing in Jesus. I got to get in Jesus so he can't find nothing in me. That's why the Bible says, he that is born of God sinneth not. There is no place in Jesus for sin. Because you've been rebirthed, not from your flesh, but from your spirit. His spirit has no No sin. Well, Brother Wilson, I don't think we can live a sinless life. Well, it depends on which life you're trying to live. His life is sinless. Yours not. <laughs> Your life is born from a nature. <laughs> That's why he has to rebirth you again so he can give you a new nature that doesn't sin. But if you operate in that nature, if you operate in your natural nature, guess what you're going to do? You can't help but sin because you know why? It is a nature of sin. It's not just the action. You can't even think right. But if you get in him, let that mind that was in him, where should it be? But if it's not in us, what mind are we working with? Right? Really, the thing is simple, but it's hard because no man, one of the hardest thing a man to do, like the devil told back in the book of Job, I and I, he'll do anything to save his life. Do you know what we'll do? We'll do anything to save our life. Even when, when the best thing to do is to give up your life so you can really see what life really is. Oh, praise God. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.14, for he is our peace. Who is? He is our peace. How many people are walking around today talking about, I need peace of mind? He is Hmm? He didn't give us no peace. When he, when he didn't give us the peace we were looking for. I know, but he didn't give us the peace. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't like his peace. I never could see his until stuff, all the storms came. See, I want my peace where no storms ever come. <laughs> huh? <laughs> but he said, my peace I give. You know, we, we want the peace of her and ain't no storm. Huh? Yeah, that's, that's, see, that's kind the world give you. No storm, we'll swear. Woo, we got peace. And all the time, things are going on around, inside of us and all kind of stuff. And we'll swear, if ain't nothing happening, we got peace. We're living in peace, man. It's really good. Because we're unaware of all the different things that's happening even in our bodies, in our world. But then Jesus come on and say, but my peace, I give. 
And how many people refuse his peace? And you sit here and struggle and beat yourself up because you got anxieties and, man, I don't know, hyperventilating. Man, we're going through some things. Jesus said, my peace, I give to you. Yeah, but I'll be back to get your peace when this stuff quieting down. It, it, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe it's just me. Maybe I am just too simple. But I cannot understand if he says he's going to give me peace. Why am I looking for peace everywhere but him? Huh? Why is it? I've, I've heard so much in these last few weeks just blows my mind what people be saying. I'm thinking, are we reading the same book? Are we believing the same God? I mean, you got people running all over the place trying to find what they're only going to find in Jesus. I, I, just, I just feel restless. I just feel like ain't no peace here. Where? Where are you looking for that? I, I'm, I'm sorry. Let me keep going. For he is our peace who has made both one. Now, we talk about oneness. God is all about it. Okay? Oneness with him first, though. Because like I said before, you may have a doctrine of oneness, but you may not have a heart that believes in oneness. You may even have all the right scriptures for oneness, but you don't have the right heart for it. Because he said now, he made both one and has broken down the middle wall of petition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Uh-oh. That, that word again. He abolished that enmity in his flesh. That's the reason why today you can come boldly to God. That's why getting your flesh together ain't going to help you get any closer because he done the abolishing in his flesh, the middle wall that separated you from God. He done the destruction. He tore it down. Says, you know what? Anytime that you need me, anytime you want me, all you got to do is just call me. All you got to do is talk to me. All you got to do is come to me. You don't have to worry about anything because I've torn it down. You can't go to God running down, talking about who your daddy was. You can't tell him what your status was in a society. You know, I've been a good person. That's not going to help you. All your good person is and all that kind of stuff was just enmity against God because the more you got good, the less God was good. When you got better, the less God you needed. Isn't that strange? We get good and we don't need God. The better we get, the less we pray. The gooder we get, the more blessings we get, the less thankful we are. I mean, I'm just being... Uh, looking at it from where I've been, maybe yours is different. Maybe you were on fire from the word go. Number one, you've been going ever since. You've been doing good. I haven't. That was not my lot in life. Because when I got better, then I figured that I'd earned everything. And I felt like I was entitled to everything. And the reason why I was entitled to everything is because God saw the work I put in. And since he's seen the work I put in, he rewarded me for my work I done. And I wish I could tell you that everything I done, I labored in love. But I didn't. The only thing God didn't forget was the labor that was done by love. 
All the, a lot of stuff I've done in my life was not a labor of love because I complained too much about it. If it was love, it wouldn't be no complaints, but I complained about it. I complained to God about it. I complained to God about y'all. So it wasn't all labor of love. I ain't going to stand and tell you today, man, I love them. No, nah, y'all was in a lot of my complaints. <laughs> I ain't calling no name who it was, but just a lot of y'all was in my complaints. And to God, I can't believe you gave me these. You gave me these people. I look across town, man, them other guys got them good folks. You sent me all the worst ones. Not y'all, not y'all here. But. <laughs> so it, it was not a labor of love. Because I got too upset to let it be a labor of love. Anyway, so he said, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself a twain, one, what kind of man? New man. So making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. In other words, he killed off all things in you. He took in him. Everything that was against God in you, he put in him. And he tore that thing up, abolished everything in there so that now we have free access. There's no reason why tonight, any other day, when you walk outside, that you can't talk to him. You can talk to God any time. You need to get in a, needle, a, fetal, a, a, a fetal position. You can walk, lay in your bed, any time of the day, any time of the night, there is no appointment taken. No secretary answering the phone. You don't get an answer machine. You can talk to God anytime. I would rather talk to God than to talk to anybody. I would rather know that, man, I can get up and he can feed me. And he will feed you every day. He may give you one word. He may not even give you a sentence. But here's one little word you can run 40 days on. Oh, praise God. And came and preached peace to you. That word peace keep coming up. How can you have Jesus and not have it? How? If you tell me today that I ain't got no peace in my life, then you need to discover then where is it at? What are you trying to get peace from? And maybe what you're trying to find peace in, Jesus is not in it. That's been my referee for my whole life. If peace is not in it, that's a very strong possibility Jesus ain't either. That's why I don't get involved in a lot of things. You know why? It doesn't bring peace to my life. And if it doesn't bring peace to my life, I already know. I ain't got to go and, and spend 40 days fasting and on my knees asking God what's wrong when I already know. He's already showed me. I sent the referee. I sent peace. Let the peace of God rule your hearts. Let it referee your heart. It don't take you long to figure out if it's the peace of God or not. He's not going to give you all these anxieties and all these kind of things and, and his peace be in that. No. I've been one of the first one. I'll be one of the first to tell you tonight. I have aborted the peace of God in my life before. He was trying to give me peace and I thought he was trying to keep something from me. <laughs> oh, here we go. I, I said... He was trying to give me peace. But see, once you get your mind, so once again, the Bible says, he who mind, he will keep him in perfect peace. Now, so what happens is that we get, 
our minds off him. And we get an idea when our mind is off him. And sometimes we'll think that that idea came from God, and so we'll try to make the idea work. I've heard people talk crazy stuff. Man, you know, the devil don't want me to have God's blessing. Please, give me a break. Give me a break. Do you honestly think that if God blessed you, that the devil could take the blessing from you? Now, all you got to do is read the Bible. Stay with it. What did that prophet say? When they paid him, he's getting ready to get some, some nice ducats. All he had to do was curse the people of God. Remember that? And he got big bucks. He's a prophet. He got up to pray. And every time he tried to pray against him, he couldn't do them but pray for him. He came, he first time the guy said, man, what are you doing? We didn't pay you to do that. He said, well, you know, okay, give me a little bit more. I'll go over and try it one more time. You know what? He went back and tried again. Guess what happened? When, when did people get you convinced that the devil can steal your blessing? Because whom God is blessed, no man, no devil can curse it. I am not looking for a blessing. When I show up, I'm showing up blessed. Okay? I'm blessed when I'm asleep. I don't wake up the next day. I don't care what I don't have. I ain't waking up the next day talking about I ain't blessed. Because I'm blessed not to have some things too. <laughs> there is a blessing in that. Trust me. A lot of times we got so much of our blessings that it become very distracting. And so I, I feel that everything I have, everything God has allowed me to have, I'm blessed. I don't look and see what I don't have. I ain't trying to figure out what I don't have because I got everything I need. Everything I need. I don't know what I could do with five bathrooms in my house right now. <laughs> I don't know what I could do with all that. I don't know what I could do with a great big King size bed in my house. I don't need it. You know what I'm saying? But we got these people today driving themselves crazy over stuff they think they need to be blessed. No. I operate from this place. I operate from being blessed. Even when bad things happen. You know what I see in it? Here comes another one. Oh, bro, Wilson, I don't believe that. Well, I do. I'm sorry. I'm kind of sold out to this. The other night, believe it or not, I know y'all keep saying, man, everything be happening to this guy. Sure enough, a deer jumped out. I ain't seen him. And it draw my attention to it. I got a feeling that God had him there purposely for me. That deer jumped out with the horns and everything, slammed in the side of my car, tore up my mirror, threw glass all in my car, and I was sitting there. And you, you, you know how the old man wants to get up and say, can you believe this happened to you? But somehow I just stayed calm. Didn't really care for it. And I got thinking, man, I got to go back to this insurance company again. 
And I know they are tired of seeing me. In the last two months, we have had quite a close relationship. They almost been close to me like God. So I said, I didn't get up early. I just took my time, fine and wet. I called him on the phone. I said, this is uh, Kelly Wilson, the guy who lived the unscripted life. <laughs> Sister Booker, but God is so good to me. When I say God is good to me, see, God is good to me. If you look at things differently, you're going to get different results. No, nah, they should. I should have went on and told them that, but I, I'm happy with the car I got. I, I'm happy. No, nah, I didn't want to tow it out. But it, it, they should have because I only paid 28 for it, and they gave that damage like $4,100. Yeah, I should have, but, you know, I'm just thinking I'm going to drive just one car at a time now. And I said, God, now, I could have got all upset, been all down, couldn't sleep, and all that kind of stuff. But see, God didn't show me back to back to back. Be thankful. I could tell you the rest of this story. But I'm on tape. <laughs> Nah, I'm, what I'm going to say, I had, a, I had a small scratch up there before that happened. I didn't notice it when I bought it. Then look at that. Look at God. He said, you do not have to ride around with that scratch on the car no more. I'm going to give you a whole side of it. Okay, Lord. If we could ever learn how to be thankful just for every day that you wake up, not, not, not because you got a check, not because you was able to pay your bills. That's all good. But man, just getting up with God every day and taking this journey and living this unscripted life because there's no script to it. You don't know the next word. You, you, you don't know what the scene is. You kind of like playing it on the fly. And yet you know the end of the story. Isn't that so? You just don't know how you're getting there, but you know the end of the story. So it's not a possibility that it, God ain't gave us a victory. It's, the victory is that. But you know what? Most of the time we think we're getting it on our own. God, if one thing God is getting through to me, Kelly, I got this. <laughs> I got this. I got to let you go, though, before... Burger King close. Questions, comment, anything? All right. Go get a deer. <laughs>